Hello, good afternoon everyone, welcome. My name is Madeline Day Delfa and I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Community Engagement here at the Rose Art Museum. And on behalf of the entire team, I want to welcome you to the Rose Art Museum. We are very grateful to have so many alumni and families here today for this homecoming for Brandeis alumna Argavan Kosravi and to celebrate her first comprehensive museum survey. I hope you've all had the chance to see the extraordinary exhibition, Argavan Kosravi Black Rain, curated by Henry and Lois Foster director and chief curator, Dr. Ganit Ankori. For the past two years, Ganit has worked closely with her former student, Argavan Kosravi, on this powerful exhibition, which we are very, very proud to have at the Rose through October 22nd. So I invite you all to come back and see it again next week as well. So without any further ado, I will turn things over to Ganit, who will introduce uh, Argavan and the program. Thank you. Wow. So first of all, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, it is, uh, we are marking the 75th anniversary of uh, Brandeis University, but also uh, an extraordinary exhibition. Uh, I think that Maddie already told you everything there is to know, but my former beloved student, Argavan Kosavi, um, I'm going to explain why we see this as a homecoming. Hi, Lan, I think there's a seat right there. So I'm going to gush a little bit because I can't help it. So Argavan was born in 1984 in Iran and uh, spend the first uh, decades of her life there. At a certain point, she moved to the capital, Tehran, uh, where she was very accomplished and uh, completed an MFA uh, at Tehran University, both in graphic design and in uh, book illustration. And she worked for almost 10 years in Tehran as a book illustrator and a graphic designer. But in 2015, thanks to an extraordinary man who was her boyfriend then and is now her husband, Amir. Amir, where are you? <laughs> He's right there. We have Amir to thank. Um, Amir told her that she should come to the US. And at Brandeis University, there is a program that would be a perfect fit for her. So in 2015, directly from Tehran, you can correct me if I make up little blunders, but Argavan came and enrolled in the post back program in studio arts here at Brandeis. Now, trust me when I tell you that I have many, many students. And trust me when I tell you that I was immediately drawn and amazed by Argavan Kosavi. Um, the talent, the personality, the brilliance. And I was very lucky because, well, it sounds horrible, but Argavan couldn't work outside the university. So I could employ her to work with me on posters because she was a graphic designer. And 2015, the most beautiful posters for all arts event. Uh, designed by this artist. I still keep them because I'm sure <laughs> that they are very valuable. <laughs> also for sentimental value. But Argavan and I kept in touch when she went on, was accepted to RISD. Again, didn't know could she, couldn't she go there. She went there, she did brilliant work. Afterwards, we continued to be in touch. And I knew that I really wanted to work together. What you will see in the, um, and fast forward about two years ago, I said to Argavan, would you consider having a museum show at the Rose? Do you remember what you said? Um. I don't know what I said at that point, but I was very excited. And this, this is like, 
So when I was a student here, at the end of the year, we had an exhibition at one of the student galleries. And when we were carrying our works to that gallery, as a joke, I said to my classmates, pointing to the rose, where are we going to show there? And we laughed maybe in 20 years. And fast forward in less than 10 years, I'm sitting here. I have a show at the rose. Eight years. Less than 10 years, yes. Yeah, yeah. eight so years. It, it feels really magical, yeah. Well, it's magical for us, and I couldn't be more proud. And the opportunity, but when I did show, uh, when we did decide to do a survey, it was very important for me not to do something like a gallery show. You always want to show your most recent work. But if you went to, the, to see the exhibition, we have works from 2015, the work she did at Brandeis, and then work she did at RISD, and then you see the kernel, the seeds, how her work developed. And for me, that's thrilling because it developed not just fast, but brilliantly, and the trajectory is very clear. I think my mic is not good. Okay, better now. Thank you. Um, so let's, let's begin. Uh, this is the exhibition that I hope all of you saw. It's in the Foster Wing, and one of the things that uh, we wanted to do, and I worked with a uh, graphic designer, Sienna Scarf. Um, she, what, what I had in mind was the way that Argavon's works kind of bring you into uh, a really magical space. I wanted the entire exhibition to feel like you're walking into one of her works. And this is what you see. It's not just the works that move from uh, flat two-dimensional works to three-dimensional reliefs to sculptures, but that everything envelopes you. There, there are many, many facets to it. And we named the uh, exhibition Black Rain, and it's named after a work of art that we brought into our collection two and a half years ago already titled Black Rain. So with your permission, we're going to start with this work and with uh, Argavon telling you a little bit about what the work means and what Black Rain indicates. Uh, thank you, Gannett, for the introduction, the generous introduction. Um, so for me, this piece is from a series that is significant because for me, it was a turning point in my studio. I made this series at the corner of our living room during the COVID uh, quarantine. I didn't have access to my studio and I liked, and I didn't like that that small space dictates the scale of my work. So I decided to make even larger pieces by breaking down each piece into several smaller panels. I could work at small pieces at the same time and then uh, combine them together at the gallery eventually to create a large piece. And this gave me the opportunity to have different depths for each panel and make more three-dimensional pieces, add found objects and wood cutouts so that my work became more sculptural. And also conceptually and metaphorically it felt relevant because as an immigrant I feel like I don't belong into one space. I feel like I, now I'm living in, in that in-between space. I'm living here. A part of me is still living back home in Iran. Um, in terms of concept and subject matter, um, most of my work is reflecting on my memories and life experiences from Iran and also following what's going on uh, after I um, immigrated from Iran, uh, which is mostly uh, around the subjects of human rights issues and more specifically women rights, which all of us saw the height of this last year during the Women Life Freedom Movement. Um, so by knowing that, then you can, um, some of the symbols are more, uh, are more, I mean, easy, more easily can be uh, accessible and interpreted, like the ball, the chain which I reduced to these black lines, the unloved shackle and also the um, broken um, sculpture of a male figure which I appropriated this 
uh, Roman sculpture of a Greek king, and I reduced those, like I omitted those details that made it more uh, col like specific to that time and that culture as like a symbol of a male dominant figure and by the placement of that head above where uh, this cropped portrait of a woman's head would be, um, I mean you can read into it more metaphorically and symbolically. So on the contrary of all these like elements of dominance and suppression like the ball chain uh, the shackle uh, and also those black drops that are coming out of that broken skull. Um, you see some elements that um, refer to something on the opposite, like the vivid color palette of the other uh, parts of the paintings, the key, the unlocked shackle, and also the book, which is the only object in the painting which is depicted in a negative space, so it's like a cutout inside that, like in that wooden panel. And by those black drops, which is something I have in other shapes in my other works, I was thinking of oil, a commodity that um, like the, the government in Iran is relying on economically, and this like correlation between um, these oil-rich countries, at least in the region, in the Middle East region, and lack of democracy, and lack of democracy is something that my main focus in my paintings are. Um, so, when you go and see the work, you will understand that even the wonderful photographs um, do not do it justice, because it is three-dimensional, because everywhere you look, you see something else. But in our work, all the major elements, the contradictory elements uh, that talk about repression, but also a kind of resilience, show up. The key, the unlocked shackle, and the book, which you will see, becomes a really, really important uh, symbol. Um, we started the show uh, with the early work, as I mentioned before. And these are the works that you see are smaller in scale, they're usually two-dimensional, but already you can see the beginning of uh, Argavon's development. You can also see the in-between of being both uh, from Iran and very, very um, immersed in the culture of her homeland, but also being in exile and uh, taking in a lot of the, uh, the host country, the uh, US and the West. So this is a really important work. This is from 2015. This was shown here at Brandeis in the, uh, one of the exhibitions that Arkhaman had. And luckily for us, uh, I was not the only fan. The other fan was our uh, administrator of fine arts, uh, Christine Kahn, and she just bought it. So when I was looking for early works, I knew where to go. <laughs> and um, here we also see the kind of uh, contradictions. Do you want to talk about it a little bit? Yeah, these are a series of works that they were all based on this like visual geometric um, structure, visual structure of tile patterns, which I um, chose as the starting point for each painting and I inserted my own imagery and these tile patterns are mostly associated with more religious contexts like in a mosque or things like that and I added my own um, imagery which is more secular, uh, more distant from religion and I, in, at that, this point I was still tiptoeing around whether I want to be like whether I want to be a figurative painting or an abstract painter because I was in that transition. So you can see that abstraction of the um, like geometric shapes and that um, symmetry. And then my intervention, which was more figurative, you can see some body parts, some objects that are more identifiable, uh, and breaking that symmetry. Right, so this contradiction between the symmetry and breaking the symmetry, using the female body, and it's called geometry of a woman, so from the very beginning, this idea of women's rights and bringing back the female body, which we also see in this, which interestingly is a, um, 
also from RISD, a student work. Uh, you said that you were learning how to use a laser on plexi. Laser cutter, yes. But you, of course, Argavon can't just do an exercise. It has to be a, a fantastic work of art. So what we have here is this box, and within the box you have an Iranian passport, um, and upon it some of your, what you call, doodles. So you want to speak to it? Yeah. So this, uh, I made this work in the early 2017. Um, late uh, 2016, we had a break. Um, I traveled back home, and shortly after I um, traveled back to the States, only a week after, um, the so-called Muslim ban uh, executive order was signed. and. Uh, Citizens of six uh, Muslim majority countries were prevented from entering the United States. And if I had stayed back home only a week more, I couldn't come back here and finish my studies. So my first reaction was anger, because I was subjected to this just because of my identity. It was like a blanket um, order. Um, and I happened to have this two of my expired passports with me, and my mind was in my studio was involved with how can I find different found images as a starting point my, uh, for my paintings. Uh, like I had like tile patterns before, um, and when this happened, I thought that I can channel my anger through my art. So I started these uh, series of works. First, I painted on the expired pages of my passport, and then I scanned high resolution on my current passport, and then printed them largely, and started painting on them. At this point, I was, I was out of Iran for like two years, and I was still very excited about the freedom I had. I could paint whatever I want. There was no, no red lines. Um, so you can see like the, the depiction of like the naked female body is now that I look back at it I see that it's part of that excitement, but later on I didn't like this like objectification of the female body, so um, I, I don't have these things in my recent works um, And the more I worked on this series uh, my work became more about so this this work became Le, uh, more um, limited to that specific political moment. And I started to look back at my memories from Iran now that I knew that uh, at least for several years I won't be able to travel back home. So beyond feeling like the immediate feeling of uh, nostalgia, I started to look back at my memories from Iran. So my work became more and more about those memories and the situation in Iran and less about that specific uh, incident, which sort of transformed my work and made me have a more clear um, idea uh, in um, during my um, creative process. Okay, so um, we'll just see two more early works and talk about them a little uh, faster, so we get to the. Um, there's a lot. Uh, Argavon has been extremely busy in the last. Uh, eight years, and especially in the last two years since we've been discussing an exhibition. There are 14 major new works that were made especially for this exhibition. So you can imagine uh, how uh, ferociously uh, Argavon has been working. Uh, this uh, Parallel Lives is if you saw it, it's an actual three-dimensional work. It's no longer a flat thing or a passport within a box. It shows your desire to move off the wall and to, to make reliefs. And the book motif, the influence of uh, Persian miniatures, and the reiteration of a kind of generic female figure, a protagonist who uh, is kind of an alter ego, all come here. Um, do you want to talk about the female figure? Because many people are ask, have asked me, is it a self-portrait? Yeah, yeah, I've been asked that question a lot, and when I started painting these uh, figures in my work, I never considered myself 
uh, but on a subconscious level, I was keeping them like the same age as mine, sort of the same race. So I'm thinking of these as like a stand-in for a woman, same from my, my generation who has gone through similar um, experiences, but I don't want it to stop there. And I hope that women, women who are coming from all different backgrounds can relate to these pieces and hopefully like this symbolic approach, let them to have their own interpretations and relate to these. Right. And these women uh, and the women that you'll see in later works often confront uh, obstacles. They're often barred. They, they stand in front of doors that are shut in front of them. And we'll see other forms of attempted repression that they overcome. First they resist, then they overcome, and then they actually fight. Uh, one of my favorite works, Morning Light, from the COVID uh, era. Why don't you tell us? Yeah. So this is one of the early works I made during the COVID shutdown. At, back then, I didn't have access to the wood shop I used to go to build the panels I paint on. And I ran out of the panels I already had. And I couldn't not to paint. I had some old books. I decided to paint on the, those old book covers. So I uh, made this, and then later, when I could build, have access to the wood shop, I uh, made the the, uh, the wood panel which the book is mounted on. Um, and it's one of the I think the only works that you al you almost don't see any um, symbol or reference to anything disturbing or unsettling. And the title also uh, um, echoes that. Um, and like the headphones, like. Uh, suggests that she's listening to music and enjoying her time. Uh, the book or the notebook in front of her suggests like creativity and how it can it can um, overcome all those obstacles that are depicted in um, the other words. Um, I think that when I look at it, um, first of all, a sentence that Argavan said, "I couldn't not to paint." I, and for me, that uh, resonates. The, the feeling that art is not a luxury. It's something, it's a, it's a form of expression that is uh, essential to Argavan and I think essential for us as viewers to, to see the product and understand, make sense of the world, and maybe imagine a better one. Um, I do think that the way that you cut her so that her mouth is absent does uh, uh, kind of allude to the fact that maybe she can talk directly, but she can read and she can write. In the uh, final work, as it appears in our exhibition, there is a little pencil that alludes to this empty notebook that she can read, she can write, she can listen to music. So freedom is often uh, em like symbolized by these creative works, and we'll see um, how that is symbolized. Uh, I want to move from these smaller works to the larger uh, works that hang nearby and show you some of the details. The enclosed uh, garden. Yeah, this is from the same series as the Black Rain, which we started the, this talk with. Um, this is one of the first time that I first times that I, I um, used found objects like the this lock that you can see, and also like those paradisical like landscape or floral um, landscape behind her, which is something like a tradition. These drawings of and paintings of like gardens and birds is something that in Persian art you can see a lot of examples. In my mind, I was thinking of how in literature or most religions, utopia or um, or paradise is is uh, de um, depicted or described as these like gardens. And I was thinking that I am addressing all these issues and thinking about all these like dark sides of the world and what is on the other side and for me like the, these garden scenes which is something in so many other pieces in the, this exhibition you can see this is like a symbol of that but it's behind this fence 
and the, bird, the birds that could um, come on the other side of that fence, found, you can find it dead, unfortunately. Right. And also with the lock, it's that specific, that kind of lock that in, you see in, in your op apartments, you, can, it, you, can, you are allowed to open the door, but to some extent, so, I mean, you can read into it more metaphorically that, like, the freedom of speech is limited to this much, to, to just show that there is freedom, but actually there isn't. Right. And you, I, I, I added a quote here where you say, you know, you take these very clear metaphors, but you, you kind of complicate them, and that you always have contradiction within your work. The work that hangs nearby also has the garden on the one side and the bomb on the other side. Um, you still have the, the woman who's fragmented and made from these different materials. And here, this is the same work, but photographed from the side. So you see that all the works, when you see them on the wall, you don't really understand their full uh, them fully. You have to walk around and see how they're made and that they're fragmented in themselves and the fragments are put together in a specific way. Um, I, I want to say that unlike many contemporary artists, Argavan makes crafts, creates these pieces all on her own. She does the woodwork, she does the plexi work, she glues the panels on top of the wood and paints with paintbrushes and acrylic. She goes and buys all the hardware and makes sure it's there. And the craftsmanship, the, the, the level of uh, finish of these works is really remarkable, as you probably saw. So not just brilliant in ideas, but also in execution of these works. Thank you. Did I say I'm proud of you? Did I say that I'm proud of you? <laughs> and then when you walk through, you see the rest of the works, and you see the relationships between the works. And here, this is a very important work when you talk about your life back in Iran, as opposed to life here. Um, um, yeah, one of the things that like it's it's part of our DNA. I think in Iran is like I think so many Iranians have thought about this. This like double life, because most Iranians in public they have to adhere to some some Islamic regulations like wearing hijab, not drinking, not so many things. And at home they have the freedom to the freedom of thoughts and also all these activities. So there is this like separation of like the private space and the public space is very distinct. I know that this separation exists everywhere in the world and during the COVID pandemic, everyone experienced that. But in Iran, it's another level, like outside of the safety of your home, things like last year's the murder of Mahsa Jina Amini could happen if you don't wear your hijab correct, like according to the law. Um, so for me, like as, for me, like the curtain that covers you, like that protects you from on the window that protects you from that private space, from the public space, symbolizes that separation. So it's another recurring element in my work. And in this piece, I wanted to to uh, ironically so, like invert that. So like um, inside, you see like the, the clouds, the sky, some, something that is supposed to be the interior, interior part of, the, of this space. And outside you can see these like soldiers that I, uh, that I appropriated from a battlefield scene from a Persian miniature painting. Um, and behind the curtain, if you look at the work in person, you see that the woman who's sitting there is reading a book. Um, and by those battlefield scenes that I have in many of my paintings, I'm thinking of them as a symbol of not attacking in a literal and physical sense, but more in a moral or metaphoric sense that can be interpreted as, as patriarchy, misogyny, or a more 
uh, institutional kind of oppression. And um, so one of the things that you see is that indoors, there's the freedom, the sky, the open sky. And even outdoors, when she's oppressed, she reads the book. She has this quest for knowledge and, uh, and freedom. You also notice that the faces of the three women um, are not seen, so you can't tell uh, anything about their emotions. And uh, hiding your emotions is also something you mentioned that is uh, very something that people need to do in Iran. But the emotions are projected onto this uh, Baroque sculpture that you chose to put on top of these geometric shapes that allude to uh, modernist art or modern abstraction. So we have the Iranian uh, Persian miniatures. You have something that looks, uh, some people said it looks like Magritte. It has a surreal feel, surrealist feeling. Um, and then you have this Baroque sculpture. Uh, why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, so uh, if I want to simplify all my works in just one word, it's contradiction. And this work is a good example of all those contradictions. In, like between time, contemporary, like the, the clothing of the figures, like the jean, and um, historic, like the, the soldiers, uh, the head of Persepina. Uh, also like Western, Eastern, Persian miniature painting, the Greek sculpture. Um, so yeah, it's one of, and also like uh, as Genit uh, mentioned, like these like, like color blocks that is something that, is, that uh, is reminiscent of the more modernist abstract approach to art and all those like detailed paintings that is like a more traditional Eastern uh, approach to art. It's like, yeah, it's like a combination of all. And because like, as both as an immigrant and also someone who grew up in Iran, that there's always this like, uh, contra like this contradiction between modern ideas, contemporary, um, traditional ideas, secular, religious, uh, is something that is part of me. So it feels re very relevant to to have it in my work. So every single work you can read the contradictions, the many, many cultures that feed into it, and then under your magic uh, become a coherent work of art that tries to embrace these contradictions, although sometimes it feels like it's breaking apart. And the story of uh, Persephone, uh, who was kidnapped by Hades uh, from her mother, uh, again, a, vi a, a thing about violence against women and not being able to show your emotions when you're in Iran, but at least being able to uh, project it onto art, uh, another important function of art. And when you walk around in the gallery, there are works like this one. Um, I'm going to go a little faster so that we have a chance. Uh, again, the different uh, iterations of the same woman, the same alter ego, which is you and women like you. Uh, or, and uh, here I wanted to show you that the soldiers are not just she's tied down with these black strings, but they also are embedded in her very garment. and. Uh, derived directly from Persian miniatures, which we will talk about in a, in a bit. And also the idea of the construction of the works are often, the architecture is very much impacted by Persian miniatures. And the works that I'm showing you now are actual works that are in the exhibition, and I'll show them to you in a bit. This one also has uh, the woman, um, the modernist uh, cube, uh, a triptych. And what's important is that even the women who are so oppressed seem to be um, defiant. Yeah, I, I, I don't like that notion of like showing women coming from that region 
as like victims or weak as someone that the West needs to go and rescue them. So they have to some level agency and they can stand up against the oppressor. So there are, in, although there are like chain, there are in like suppressed uh, situations, but they are in a pose that projects power, confidence, and control. And, and that becomes even more prominent as the women become uh, not just resilient and resistant, but they become warriors themselves. But before that, I wanted also to share this work uh, at her fingertips because in addition to the very, very clear influence of specific uh, elements from uh, Persian mini miniatures, although also undermining them because Persian miniatures take three-dimensional reality or an, a building and then uh, with geometric forms on a flat sheet of paper or vellum, they uh, do that, and Argavon takes these flat um, folios from these manuscripts, and then she makes them, she turns them into three-dimensional works themselves. Also, the beauty that is deceptive, they're, they're so stunningly gorgeous, the Persian miniatures, but when you look deeply, you see very disturbing things like murder and rape, and the same thing with Argaban's work. The, the beauty is uh, overwhelming sometimes and seductive. When you look clearly, you see that there are things of oppression. And but one, not only oppression. I wanted you to talk about the... One thing I want to add about the Persian miniatures if, is that in most of them, the women are absent or they are depicted in like more marginalized positions that they lack agency and I want to subvert that also to have women depicted in this like very central prominent positions that are often like proportionally larger than the surrounding areas. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we'll see that in the next examples as well. Uh, I wanted to also say that in as opposed to the ball and chain and the, and the black lines that tie her up, we have these golden threads and this luminosity around the fingers that is a recurring motif. And uh, we talked a lot about that as related to spirituality mm -hmm. and creativity and uh, some power that women have at their fingertips. I think it's related to your specific fingertips and your, <laughs> because that's, that's your power, that's your superpower <laughs> to create these works of art. Uh, I also want you to notice the uh, elements, not just the architectural elements that are derived directly from the Persian miniatures, but also in the background you have the gardens. Again, the garden as a symbol of paradise or a utopian uh, place. And you have the cypress trees and the uh, flowering branches. And then you have the black water, which alludes to the black rain. And it comes directly from uh, a visual source, which mm -hmm. maybe yeah. you can oh. share with us. Yeah, when I was looking at these like Persian miniature paintings, <coughs> and they used uh, silver pigment to depict water. Um, wherever they wanted to like have like a pool or like a river and over time that silver is oxidized and now it looks black and that's how I thought about this like black liquid is that is in this like paradisical scene there is this black liquid um, and I thought it reminded me of oil so that's how that idea started and um to make all of Argavan's dreams come true, which is my mission in life, uh, we went together to the Harvard Museums uh, and we looked through their Persian miniatures and we also looked through the MFA. We have wonderful museums around. And we got uh, loans of six incredible works that we chose that had, uh, this is what the wall looks like. Um, and um, they're all together and we couldn't put them 
you know, because of lighting and uh, all sorts of uh, other considerations, but um, they do relate directly to a lot of the works, and uh, it was quite thrilling to go there and see them. That's the most exciting part, part of the show for me, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I accept. <laughs> And um, sometimes I, I could in the hang, hang them in proximity so you can stand in the corner. The green wall shows all the loans and the baby blue, <laughs> a baby boy blue, that's the color if you want it for your dining room. That's the <laughs> color that we chose. Uh, is all of Argavon's work and you can compare these two works one to the other and uh, I want to start with uh, what um, Argavan said, that if you look at uh, Persian miniatures like this one from the Shah Nama, which is the Iranian Book of Kings, and most of the works are from there, and you can talk a little bit about it, the woman is up here, and she's just watching the scene of uh, Siavush. And Argavan, has a woman, it's like a, a, um, a narrative where you have the woman pushed down, then the woman here, a female Siavush uh, with her horse walking through fire, and then the woman up here. But first, why don't you tell the story of Siavush? Yeah, so it's one of the stories from Shah Nama, the Book of King, which is the story of a Persian prince who is accused of sexual misconduct and is um, subjected to trial by fire. So if he can pass through that fire and exits from the other side unharmed, he proves his innocence. In my work, I appropriated that scene and I replaced that male figure with a female protagonist. Uh, and then you can think about that story in the new context of my painting and interpret it in that way. Um, and um, also one of the other things that was for me interesting was um, these like black like surfaces that lack any visual inf like information or texture or color and I like to have that like contrast and contradiction uh, of like these like black surfaces which uh, allude to a more modernist abstract way of painting and then the other painted surface areas that are have a more um, traditional approach, uh, if you will. Yeah, and you know, if uh, we have the same uh, Bernini sculpture, because you can't see the women's expressions mm -hmm. a little bit here, but the woman is, you know, and women in Iran are accused of the same thing of uh, sexual misconduct. You know, there's always this. Uh, uh, false accusations uh, by the regime and here she's thrown down you don't see her face but you can see next to her these uh, classic um, uh, these sculptures uh, that allude to the emotions then you have the female Siavush uh, walking through and at the top instead of just having a woman look through I read it as the woman who uh, succeeds in going up, I think I have, yeah, I love her. She's uh, not just looking out at the garden, she's free and she's reading a book. Again, the book as a symbol of her uh, freedom. Um, across from the uh, wall with the Persian miniatures, we place three new works. Um, all of them have women reclining, but I called it disorientalizing the odalisque. We know the ubiquitous reclining nude or odalisque, especially uh, Western artists looking at uh, oriental women, showing them as objectified, uh, uh, sexualized, naked women. And in Argavon's work, what we have is uh, these uh, women who are, instead of uh, being um, objectified by a male gaze, they look inward 
or they look out, but they resist objectification. They resist this uh, um, idea. And uh, one of the quotes that I put up that you may not remember that you said, but you did, uh, that the women dwell within a space of dreams, a subconscious realm that activates their imagination. So this idea of you, horrible things may happen to you when you're out there, but you can always find freedom within and use your imagination to create uh, uh, an alternative reality. And this one uh, of the woman, um, you know, the, the little red flag, it's right across the gallery from uh, the battle scene. And we have other uh, many, many works by women who even though their mouths are tied and they're shackled, they're still resilient, they still resist. Um, and what happens uh, with the last works is that from being just resilient and resisting, over the last year you've transformed the women into warriors. Yeah, yeah after last year's events in Iran, the protests and the uprisings, now that the women were fighting back against the oppressor, I thought that they should, I should depict them in these like warrior clothes. So like the helmets, the, uh, the armors, these are all uh, like the war clothes that in my earlier works in those battlefield scenes you could see, or for example, quiver and arrows. Is we have thing. that. Yeah. So we have this one too where you have the women uh, protected by this uh, um, armor that's composed of these uh, five pieces. And also the importance of hair. This like, now in Iran it's more than, it's like a political concept, like the women's hair and how defying, by defying wearing the compulsory hijab, it has become an act of resistance and this civil disobedience. So for example, in this piece, the whole piece is it's standing on the woman's hair and the central composition helps the eye to, to be focused on that. And in these two works, the hair, actual human hair, uh, is um, incorporated. incorporated into your work. So let's talk about this one and this one. Yeah, these are um, two of the most recent works in this body of works. And um, although like these over the past few months, uh, you don't see an, any protest on the streets of Iran, but on a daily basis, women by not um, accepting to wear the compulsory hijab and showing their hair in public are, um, are fighting back. So I thought that the the woman the women's hair has become like a weapon to fight back. So um, I appropriated these like quiver and arrows and replaced the feathers at the end of each arrow, but with um, actual human hair to simplify to uh, symbolize that. So the hair becomes a weapon, and women become warriors. And the works move from being very small to dimensional works to being quite large, uh, very um, monumental figures. Uh, this is one of my favorites uh, called uh, True to Self. And you see what it looks like from general view and then what it looks like in the reflection in the mirror behind, which is part of this piece. So let's talk about what you did with this uh, figure, what kind of body she has. Yeah, so it's, um, so I was interested in depicting the whole figure, this like cropped portrait as like a missile by that pedestal, which, and adding those like parts that makes it, and the helmet, the shape of that helmet. So she became like, like a weapon as a whole. And also I like this uh, to, to experiment with this, with the idea of contradiction in, again in this work uh, by this like contrast between at first glance when you look at the portrait, her eyes are closed, he has headphones on as if she's 
in an inward state and she's not paying attention to her surrounding. But the, the more you look at the piece, when you realize the reflection of the other side in the mirror, you realize that she's staring back at you and she's very aware of what's going on. Right. So um, there was a very interesting conversation here called Parallel Lives where you spoke with uh, two other with a uh, with two other Iranians living in exile, and Marjan Kamali and Shahla Ari. Right, right. Uh, an anthropologist from BU and a writer who is now a visiting a scholar here at Brandeis. And one of the things that came up that I found really fascinating was that as Iranian women, not only did you you have a sort of coping mechanism, a survival mechanism, is never to show what you're feeling. Never to show, uh, to kind of save yourself uh, from, from the outside world. But then, on the other hand, you have to be vigilant. You have to know exactly what's happened. And, and this is like, this captures that contradiction so well. The same figure uh, is both seemingly passive, but even if she seems to be passive, it could be a resistance, a form of resistance. So um, the last work that I want to share with you uh, is called uh, Fractured Spaces, Fragmented Spaces, we called it actually. And um, it is very clearly uh, three-dimensional, and impacted by uh, the architecture within a lot of the Persian miniatures, but other things are happening here. Yeah, for uh, so, yeah, I was very interested in this um, Roman sculpture, which is like a grave sign of a woman who who is mourning the death of his her infant. Uh, but I tried to um, extract this, this imagery from that, con with that context and put it in this new context that you can see women that are wearing like old, like his historic Persian clothes to the woman, which is wearing more contemporary clothes. There are uh, references to like those angels that you can see at the upper part that are referencing to something from a more religious context to some something more secular, which is what is going on in the other parts of the paintings. And I have in my recent works more uh, references to these like angels, and I'm looking, I'm thinking of them in a more secular sense, not angel in a heaven-like situation, but angels that on earth are like agencies of change in a way. Um, yeah, and this is the last work in the show, and it, unlike the others, I think it's uh, pointing in a direction where the fragmentation um, is kept. The contradiction is very prominent, and there's no uh, attempt to reconcile the spaces, whereas in the others, there's something that makes it more cohesive. And um, I'm, you know, we see the contradiction between the missile instead of the baby and the, the pomegranates, which are such a, an important symbol in Iran and the Middle East in general of fruitfulness and life and uh, prosperity. Uh, exactly. But uh, again, the, the contemporary woman in front of a closed door, um, it seems like we don't know what will happen here. And uh, again, an overview of what we see here. Uh, we see one of the new sculptures that you said is one of your favorites. It's called Daughters and Mothers. And I'm wondering if um, it's really incredible. You need to stand near it to really uh, see it. And also you discover the incredible paintings that are embedded within these uh, gradations of colors. But um, tell us. Yeah, this piece, I was very inspired by, again, all these freestanding works I made after 
the last year's protests in Iran. And there were a lot of um, young girls and women who were, um, who were shot dead last year. And after that, their, their mothers started that resistance by mourning, that they turned the mourning for their beloved ones into an act of resistance. And for me, it was very, very touching and very powerful. So this piece for me was like an attribute to that. So if you, this, I mean, we, in, this photograph doesn't show all the details, the other side. So if you look closer to different parts of the painting, you can see references. By knowing this story, you can see references um, to, yeah, to this, this subject matter. And that really uh, tells you that seeing slides when the real thing is right around the corner is not a good idea. You have to really experience Argavon's uh, incredible work face-to-face uh, -face and let it, um, let it um, speak with you. Uh, someone said not only that uh, going into the show is like uh, delving into, diving into your, your mind, your, your, each work of art, but each work of art is almost like an exhibition. Uh, a whole exhibition, and there's always another, you know, always another layer of meaning, just as there's always another layer of material that you use. And uh, with that, I hope you join me in thanking Argavan. So the images say very oh, you did, you whatever did I did so well.